All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special episode. We've got the 100th game coming up. So Brayden and myself thought we'd deep dive, tell you some stories about my career, stories about the last 100 games that maybe you haven't heard yet. And that's what we're here for. It's going to be an interesting chat. I'm not sure where this is going to go. There's going to be some funny stories, some interesting stories, some ups and downs. Don't get me wrong, but it's going to be exciting. I can promise you that. So listen in. It's going to be good fun. All right, everyone, very, very special podcast that is about to get underway. Mason Cox, as you all know and love the great man, a hundred game special. Now, Mm. very, very big accomplishment. I think we all know the journey, but we'll we'll go through the first part really quick. I don't know if you guys know this, but he was born in America, was it? Uh, American, am I? Yes. So he was born in America, found out about the game (laughs) around 22 I'm over here, and the rest is history. Do we want to talk about college? Nah. No. We'll save that for another podcast, an after dark episode. So we've been through the early stuff. Now we're just going to get right into the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts, the 100 games. Mm. So 100 games for the Collingwood Football Club. Now it almost wasn't for the Collingwood Football Club. If, you, if you're judging by North Melbourne's videos that they put out there, <laughs> head to toe North Melbourne kit. You could have been playing down in Tassie. Cool. Unlucky. Got the game for uh, Collingwood. Now talk us through this because, you know, it's pretty <laughs> head to toe. You had the polo, My the shorts. Mate. You were out there. Pimped me out oh, in they North were doing, Melbourne They gear. got Brad Scott doing interviews about you going like, oh, he's the next big thing, Mason Cox, and we're going to snap him up. How close was it? Not even remotely close. I think, uh, look, North Melbourne, maybe just turn off the next, if you're a North Melbourne fan, turn off the next yeah, minute of this podcast. North Melbourne walked in, and Brad, you know, he's a coach of a football club, right? He makes that decision. It's not on him what goes on behind the scenes. And their club, Arden Street, beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But whenever you go to calling a football club and then you go to Arden Street, you see the vast difference. And the big kind of carrot they had, they had Eric Wallace there, absolute legend, American that was playing for them on their list at the time. And they had the idea that he could, you know, grow me as a player and teach me how to play the game because he had been through it himself. That was their biggest carrot. And it just, it just comparatively, it was tough. Like, sorry, North Melbourne, but this is, we've talked about this on the podcast. It's very hard to keep up with the top tier echelon uh, clubs that have the facilities. But what, yeah, where you're coming from though is also college basketball, college in the States. It's, it's mm. a bit different, right? We come over here and we're like, oh, Collingwood's the biggest and best, but. My basketball university, the university that I played basketball for, their locker rooms, 5X what mm. Collingwood was. So coming into the country, seeing Collingwood's, I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't impressed. I was kind of like, yeah, like I've just come from a way better facility. Like we had a half a million dollar marble staircase going from the top level to the bottom level of our locker room. We had just the cow skin rugs everywhere because we're in Oklahoma, had the 12 TVs all lined up, custom pool table, like custom seats for the, uh, for the vision room, all that, you know, like stupid money, just stupid cash. There's a guy that donated over half a billion dollars to our university. So you can imagine buy the whole AFL. Exactly. (laughs) That's it. Like we all know it's, I'm not getting into that, but uh, (laughs) there's just, there's so much money that's influxed into this thing that, you know, the facilities, cause you can't play players. The facilities is where the money went. Mm. So it was always top tier, top echelon type stuff. And that came to here and everyone's like Collingwood biggest, baddest in the land, you know, and to be honest, you know, I love calling it, obviously, don't get me wrong, but like whenever I came in, they were like, we have custom weight sets. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, cool, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was things like that that were probably very impressive for Australian sports, but compared to the US side of things, it was almost below what I expected. Yeah. And you would have been like, can these guys pay the check <laughs> every month? <laughs> you would have felt like it's well, a... People told me that. People told me if you go to North Melbourne or someone else, you are not financially guaranteed to get your paycheck at the end of the, end of the <sighs> month. And I was... That actually scared me being someone from half a world away thinking... Because remember I heard about AFL, I thought it'd be an Eastern European kind of like basketball that I didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. I'm just hoping to be able to make it out of the country like if things go shit, Right. And that was like a big fear of mine. So someone, I, I can't remember who it was, but people someone could tell you anything. Fear, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, seriously, I had no idea. So I believe whatever people told me. Now you arrived at Collingwood, did the full signing, got mm. you over. Decker had 
you know, a big hand to play in that. How was the pitch in getting you over here? There was a massive sales pitch, not only from the Collingwood and Derek Hines, but also the AFL. And they put a lot of a lot of media into this big American coming over to uh, Australia and and playing. Because I remember before I made my decision, right, last day in Australia, they take us out for this five star dinner. AFL, shout out to the AFL. Take us out to this five star dinner. They've got the agents. They're gonna, I'm gonna sign with it there. We get the beers are flowing. You know, there's Coronas on the table. There's you know all these. I couldn't fathom it being a kid that was eating ramen noodles from college. I was just like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Red carpet treatment, right? Because they flew you around everywhere. Flew me around everywhere. Just, you know, I was essentially media darling for them for a week. And um, got these, you know, the beers flowing, you know, everyone's there that I kind of met throughout the week. And uh, we get to the nitty gritty and stuff. And they're kind of trying to get me to sign a contract. And this is, I don't know if I've ever actually told this story, but I am blind drunk like blind drunk at this point. Cause it was like all the, you know, all the stuff had been done for the week. Like we were very into this trip. Hadn't had any enjoyment as far as like going out, having beers and a night out. So this was our night. And we get up to this sports bar at the crown and I'm sitting there and the two agents at the time that the AFL had given to me, you know, show me, cause I hadn't seen any of the contracts beforehand. They show me the different contracts. Port Adelaide, I think was the only one that didn't give me a contract that I would look at. So yeah, like North Melbourne, Fremantle. I told them I wasn't going to go to Fremantle. Um, so it was either North Melbourne, Richmond, Collingwood, right? Puts all three in front of me. You look through the details. Some are giving you a car. Some aren't. You know, there's little details in there. I was so blind drunk, couldn't even read the lettering. I was <laughs> hammered. And I'm at this sports bar and I'm with the agents and we're finally getting down to business, right? Business of like signing a contract to come to this country or not. And I am so blind drunk. And I just look at my brother and I look at the agents. I go, can we just have five minutes, please? Can we just have a little chat? My brother and I, I just want to talk through some of the details here. And my brother, Nolan, who's been on the podcast, great, great conversation. If you haven't, go back and listen to it. And um, we kind of sit down and say, I'm, I'm hammered. I can't read anything on this thing. Can you read it? He goes, no, nah, there's no chance we're making decisions here. So we went back to the agent and said, we'll go to America. We'll talk to the fam. We'll sort it out. We'll sober up more than anything. Play uh, yeah. And it was like the IFL and the agents were like trying to get me to sign then and there before I left the country because they were wor worried if I left the country, I wouldn't come back. Yeah. So it was a real interesting last night um, <laughs> in Australia around it. And yeah, they kind of, I feel like at times looking back on it, I feel like they tried to dupe me into signing a contract I wasn't prepared to sign. <laughs> and you drunk? Luckily, off my drunk conscious state, I was able to make the decision not to sign that. But obviously, went back to America and um, called up all the different clubs, said thank you, and then uh, told Colin what I was going to uh, to go and play for them. So now you have your very experienced agent, Nolan. Nolan uh, Cox. <laughs> working, working. Old <laughs> uh, times tonight. He yeah. just, he's, he'll show up. Now, Let's jump into the journey because it's a fair journey at that. So you fly, you know, halfway across the world and then you meet up with the team and you go on a preseason camp to Falls Creek. Beautiful place. Beautiful place. Normally yeah. it's snowing there. But Not this time of year. <laughs> you guys go in the summer. Um, so you're really, you know, meeting the guys for the first time and battling mm. it out uh, in these really weird circumstances. What did you kind of take from that first big preseason training camp and in particular kind of meeting up with Brody Grundy and kind of he really set the tone most years at preseason camps. He was a yeah. beast. So like what did you learn like getting into that? I think the cool thing about that, that was probably the first time I got to really get to know players because like we're all staying in the same hotel and stuff. You know, you're playing card games at night and all that kind of stuff and you just get to know people on a personal basis because all the guys have played growing up you know are played against each other in different leagues and stuff here and there and i'm just this token american and it's rolled up and you know it's a first to four years camp so these people are 18 to like 22 max i think there was sam dwyer was like 30 <laughs> it's like rolled around it's like dude you should definitely not be here um but i remember that was like kind of one of the big things i kind of felt like i was just kind of like on the side because i was older and all these guys who were a younger kind of group they were coming in and trying to sort themselves out and you think about like how much you change between 18 and like 23. Yeah. There's a lot of life changing that happens between then. And a lot of these kids, you know, at 18, were trying to figure out what they were going to do and thrust into this AFL lifestyle and everything else. And that was kind of my way of getting to know people. Like um, Marley was a guy I got to know early. Darcy, obviously. Um, Brody was the main person that I think I looked to. And you kind of look around and you go, okay, who can I become close with? I know is going to get me 
to the best part. Oh, sorry, get me to be the best player I can be. And Brody is one of those people. He's one of the hardest work ethic kind of people, and he's a beast in the mm-hmm. gym. Like he works his ass off, and he's one of those people that never gives up. So I kind of, you know, you 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 ride on the coattails of other people, you know, and you want to help them bring you to a certain level. And Brody was that person for me for a long time, and um, still very close to them, obviously, but. We always kind of have those competitions going against each other, and I'd always try to be the the guy that was trying to prove his you know prove his worth. And we had Jared Witz also there, you know, who's you know big winner. yeah, big winner is captain captain of Gold Coast. So it's there was a lot of guys in there that are big men that you know are quite successful now that I was able to kind of have you know show me the ropes as far as what was appropriate and you know what you had to give up and what you had to sacrifice and the uh, the effort you had to put into it. So yeah, those Falls Creek camps that was kind of I think the biggest thing I got out of it and. And um, I remember back to the days of the, some of the, you know, the, I guess the challenges Brody and I, you know, and he used to do like the boxing and Brody would just beat mm. the living shit out of you. Like, <laughs> man, no one wants to go up against him. Even whenever he warms up for games, he is the most aggressive, like bumps and tackles person before yeah. game. Never, I would always just like end up in the bathroom somehow magically because <laughs> like we're the same height. So instantly you go with each other. Freak. But anyway, we used to have battles here and there and there's one. There's a famous photo whenever I look back on my career, all the different photos and stuff. And there's one of myself and Brody, and I'm a scrawny, scrawny kid at this point. And Brody's this big human, you know, and we're running down this massive mountain after a full day of training. We're doing like ice baths in this, like, you know, uh, lake with snow on the ground and push ups all the way up this mountain. Everything else, you get to the very top, and there's a sprint down the very end to try to like win it because everyone's on different teams. And Brody and I were just in this dead heat. And I remember like coaches going, like, this is fucked. Like these two, full momentum, like no stopping, pushing each other, trying to make sure like one, one, like well, you know, one, one over the other. And I just, there's this famous photo and we're dead even. And I don't even know who won it, but I just remember at the end of it, we were so fucked. I just laid on the ground. I was so exhausted. And I was just like, this is the guy that I want to be able to push. Cause I know if I push him, that's going to be pushing myself to the limit also. And I'll be a better player for it. So yeah, big shout out to Brody. He's uh, one of those people that's definitely made me a, a better human off the field and also a better player on the field. It's a sketchy one, that one, running flat out down a gravel hill. It was There was no, <laughs> like, I, I, if I wanted to stop, I couldn't. The yeah. momentum, it just carried us because it was such a steep hill. Like, we just kept going. It was almost as though, like, the finish line was there and we just kept running down the hill another 30 meters past it because there's no stopping us. The cool thing is you've been here for a lot of these early moments, too. Like, you were at the club seeing yeah. some of this as it was playing out. Yeah, it I felt like at the time we all knew that we were watching something that was significant. Uh, a lot of us like looked over, stopped what we were doing, kind of clapping you guys running in. A lot of people shouting out and stuff like, yeah. And that what you said about that photo, it's, it's almost defining of both of your journeys moving mm-hmm. from like forward from there. Uh, Neither one of us will ever fucking give in. Yeah. There's been so many times where it'd be like sprints on the treadmill and stuff. And he sits there and he goes, I'm going to put it to 13. I go, mm-hmm. I'll put it to 14. He goes, I'll put it to 15. Or 15 and a half. <laughs> yeah. so like, he's such a hard just, worker. Yeah, he just doesn't. He's always the biggest man in the gym, always benching the most, you know, squatting the most, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, he just always wants to be better. And it's someone you always want to have, you know, in your in your corner and someone you always want to have, you know, helping you to be, like I said, the best player you can be. And it is a difficult thing, as we touched on, we probably touched on it um, a fair bit in last week's episode, that it's you best mates with some of these guys. Yeah, and then fighting for a spot. The players that you draw for the ruck position, Brody Grundy, mm-hmm. arguably the competition's best. And then Jared Witz goes on to have a career as captain of the Gold Coast and you're still here. Yeah. So credit to you. But- I don't know how the hell I outlasted both of them. <laughs> but the thing is, one of those moments I think in my career that I had to pick and choose was like, I looked at it and I said, Brody Grundy's ruck, Jared Witz is ruck. I knew the coach's trust and faith was in them too. Yeah. And they were fighting it off to see who'd be the number one rock at the time. And um, I was obviously like, you know, third, fourth string as far as rocks at that point. And I kind of made the realization early in my career and lucky for it and probably through some guidance of some coaches of saying like, if I wanted to get playing time early in my career and make it in the IFL, I had to have something they didn't have, yeah, which was being able to play forward. Yeah. So I, I made that commitment for a year to say I was going to learn the Ford craft, learn different like leading patterns, everything else to get used to that. And then that would allow me to slot in and be a second rock slash Ford, which was somewhat of a spot we didn't have at the time. Yeah. And they tried, whenever they tried to play two rocks, it didn't work because it was just n- neither one of them could go play forward. So I was like, if I can fill that gap of something they're looking for, change the total trajectory, my, my trajectory in my career. And like, so grateful for it. Cause even now it's like, we're playing with Darcy and myself, Darcy mm. Cameron and myself. And like, both of us can go forward and that gives us, you know, 
gives us a bit of options uh, in the rock. Whenever someone's playing good or bad, whatever it is, we can leave people in certain positions and the other one can still fill another role. And as we go through, there'll be a lot of sliding door moments Very much similar so, yeah. to that. Um, but we jump into your, I guess it's technically your first game of footy. First time organized football. Yeah. So VFL. Round one, 2015 in Ballarat. Ripper of a game. Real rough one that's to what draw. everyone wants to do. Play the first game in Ballarat. Surely that's a bit of a tester. It's like, let's send the big yank out to VFL in Ballarat and see if he survives. See, I moved to this country and I was like, beaches, beautiful women, beautiful weather. And you throw my ass into Ballarat where it was raining, sleeting, sunny, windy, all in one game, so bad that we had buckets of hot water on the sideline. Just whenever you came off, you could just put your hands in there, get a bit of feeling back in the extremities, go back and play. And I was like, I remember going to this game thinking, what the fuck have I decided to do with my life? Yeah, driving way out there. Now, shout out. <laughs> shout to, out Ballarat. We love Ballarat. To Ballarat. And I'm sure there's plenty of beautiful women out of Ballarat. <laughs> Uh, but you weren't alone out there. You played your first game, Darcy Moore, Jordan DeGoey, Braden Maynard, yeah. Ma- Mason Cox. So yeah. it turned Probably out- in that order too. Yeah. <laughs> turned like- out to be a pretty good little uh, drafting period for, for them. Uh, apparently you kicked a goal. Now, yeah, I don't really remember it, but yeah. And we don't remember it, but, it was we'll, vision. <laughs> we'll, but we'll take it. Uh, now another obscure first game, which is probably your first game in the actual AFL squad took yeah. place in Bendigo preseason against Carlton. Carlton. Now, this would have been, you've had the experience in the VFL or whatever. Mm. Now, this is a moment of, all right, am, Sink I, or swim. Yeah, am I ready to step up and play with the, the big boys? This is about three to four, maybe f- yeah, probably about four months into actually landing in Australia and learning the game. Knowing what AFL is. Yeah, I was real nervous because I mean, like I, at this point, I'm playing a game and I'm still questioning whether if an umpire points a certain way, what the hell that means? Like, I didn't know details of the game that people knew their whole lives. And I was just kind of like, all right, just run the same direction as the other Ruckman, follow him around, and you surely just try not to make an ass of yourself. And I did that okay, I will say. I, I played a half a game. I came in at halftime, played against their Ruckman, and yeah, it was all right. Like, I got a few different hitouts. I think I showed him enough promise to say, like, oh, okay, like he actually has you know, a bit of coordination that like we might be able to work with. And I just remember like the game was a bit crazy in that sense of like getting there, the bus ride up. And I remember getting to the locker rooms and it was like local footy locker rooms. I was like, life has really taken a real shit storm. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just like grade six, like, you know, school lockers. And that was the, the locker room. Yeah, Concrete floors. Yeah. Brick walls. Like putting on booty shorts and a sleeveless jumper for the first time. This is something that I want to ask you because obviously shorts above the knees in America, real far. Yeah, very far. So what are you, are you telling your mates back home what you're actually doing or are you just nah. tell, cherry embarrassed. picking the best parts? I was, I was cherry picking the best parts. And they were just like, you're playing soccer? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Soccer. We're playing soccer. So you even think like soccer players have longer shorts than the NFL players. Yeah. It's a real, it's embarrassing. But anyway, I, I digress. It's, very unique IFL to wear sleeveless in the middle of winter and shorty shorts in the middle of winter. But this is the way the, the world works. And even wearing Speedos, like Speedos, you can imagine in America are not a thing. So whenever I came over here and I'd wear my first Speedos, it was a real kind of like cover your nuts moment, you know, of like yeah. walking around and people just sitting there with their shit out. And you're like, okay, I guess this is going to be normal for the next few years. And unfortunately... Every time you're in Speedos, it means you're getting in and out of cold water. Yep. So it's not, it's not a pretty sight. No one's walking around strutting after getting in the ice bath. I'll tell you that, Brayden. Uh, so there was plenty that came out of this post-game interview. You said it was oh, your yeah. your best and worst game of your career. Yeah, because I'd never played any other game. It was, it was hilarious. Like I had no idea what I was doing. And I remember like one of the big things I remember from the game was walking off. And uh, you shake everyone's hand. One of the last people I shake was this guy, and he had that much fucking tape on him. It was just like, what are you doing? And I was shaking his hand, and he was the nicest guy you ever met. He was like, mate, great story. I want to wish you all the best in your career. Um, really, you know, admire what you're doing over here and like giving it a crack. And I was like, oh, that guy's so nice. You know, and I walked off. Thanks, buddy. Next, yeah, I was like, thanks, buddy. And then, like, next thing I know, I turned, like, I turn around, and he's getting interviewed by Channel 7 or whatever it was. Now, I look at Darcy, and Darcy's probably the person I was closest with at this time. I said, Darcy, that guy was super nice. Like, who is he? He goes, mate, that's Chris Judd. He's like one of the best players to ever play. He's like, how do you not know who that is? And I was like, if he's not the Rockman, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And still to this day, 
Same problem now. That's plenty of guys <laughs> rolling around. I got no idea. I'd recognize Chris Judd now. Don't get me wrong, but there's plenty of other midfielders rolling around in the AFL. I got no damn clue. I often think that, that you're really learning everything from scratch. And I, yeah. I, I've been surprised over times when I make a reference and you're like, you know that situation. Because there's, there's a lot of history in the AFL. Mm. And, I mean, you've only had a limited time to catch up on it all. I think it probably helps that you'd... you'd Dad's a bit of a nut job with with the Oh footy. my gosh. My dad literally and this is a funny story. I came I came home the first time after playing my first year. I came home in the off season and I, I walk in on our dining room table is uh, Australian rules football for dummies. You know the big yellow books <laughs> yeah. with like the black outlining. And he's written he's read the whole thing. He's tabbed and like folded the paper corners of everything he like about Collingwood essentially, everything yeah. about Collingwood. He's read the thing front to back. He would know more about AFL than 99% of fans just, and he's from America stays up at like 4 a.m. to watch every single game last night after the Carlton game give me tips <laughs> That's, yeah, nice. I'm like dad no <laughs> just no oh, I, felt giving, I felt like giving uh, you tips when I saw your set shot goal kicking yeah, fair call. now we're getting into the real stuff yeah and we've talked about this a lot but 2016 rolls around mm. very you know timely interview last week with Travis Cloak who made way for yeah. you to play your first game being picked, let alone picked for your first game to be Anzac Day. Yeah. Did you know what you were getting into or was it just a, you know, you're just excited to play your first game? It was a shit storm that week. I had no idea what to expect, what was going to happen. I'd only experienced one Anzac Day before and that was the year prior. I didn't, I didn't really quite understand a lot of the stuff around it. Like I'd gone to the, uh, to the shrine, understood the history of like, you know, the Anzacs, but I think around the game and the history of it and the big spectacle that it is, I didn't quite understand until after the game, probably. Um, but a lot of it, like there was so much, I guess, like commentary around whether or not I'd play my first game, you know, for the weeks prior and all that kind of stuff. And even the year prior, like we didn't make finals and the club was talking to me about whether or not, because Jason Holmes had debuted as the first American ever born, born and bred American to ever play. And he played his first game. The club was like, oh, do we want to, you know, do we want to try to give Mason that kind of same credit to be like the first one to ever play AFL? Uh, and they kind of gave me the, they said to me essentially, like, we don't want to rush this. We see a future with you. You know, we want to make sure whenever you play, you're ready for it. And we're not just throwing this out there. And uh, Jason played really well, so credit to him. And I always have to say I'm the second born and bred American ever play. And uh, Jason probably hangs it on me a bit. But yeah, going into that week, like my parents found out I was playing before I did got the flights booked and everything else. And then the brothers came over and it was just chaos. Like, and the same thing whenever like 2018 and things like that around the grand finals, like you look at the whole week and it's just like a bit of a blur. Like you do remember like little moments, other things here and there, but there's just so much going on that I don't know. It was kind of nice because once the game got there, you kind of were like, all right, all this stuff that's been in my mind and happening here and there and everything else is just kind of doesn't matter anymore. It's like, you can just focus on the game. And that was kind of relieving, to be honest, more than anything. It was just a crazy, crazy week. And then, yeah, Darcy Moore, who we talked about, you know, was one of the first friends I met in the in the club and his family kind of took me in. He looked after me and super, super grateful for what he's, you know, given to me over my career. He actually gave me my jumper and you think this kid's 19 years old, probably at the time. Yeah. And his maturity he had to be able to do that. And that's like a special moment that people don't forget in their lives. And at 19 to give a jumper to a, a friend of yours was pretty cool. And, and it's a sign of, you know, where he's at now. It's like, it's pretty cool to see him as captain and something I always kind of saw um, the opportunity for him to be able to do that if he wanted to. And he's taking it by the horns now, but to get, have him give me my jumper and then be the person that kicked the ball into me, it was just kind of a pretty amazing moment. Like, I don't even know, you can't really describe it. I'll never be able to fully describe it to someone, but take the mark, kick the goal, and then have the whole team that, iconic photo in my mind of the whole team jumping on my shoulders like it was just crazy like fuck man like I never thought it would happen I didn't think I'd ever really play an AFL game at times and had been through some shit and then came out the other end of it and then kind of had the opportunity and took it by the horns and luckily it was successful enough in it to to get some more games behind that and um, yeah it was just cool to have the family there and Darcy be a part of it and you know everyone else be there that kind of was through my career and yeah it was I don't know it's, it's like so fortunate. This is the thing I think about mostly whenever I think of that day of just having everyone there. It's a rare sight to have the whole family in town at once and then for them to be there on that day and experience it with me. It just, yeah, it meant the world to me. You kick your first goal with your first kick, mm. which is the first goal of the game. Crowd erupted. 
then from there, was it hard to kind of settle? Because you, you got around, you took some more marks and stuff, you finished out the game. The whole thing would have just been like a whirlwind. There's a, yeah, the whole thing is a whirlwind. Like I didn't, even looking back now, I think there's maybe one other play I really remember from the whole thing. I think I like tapped it down Alex Solo and he had a shot for goal. But the funny thing is, is looking back now and a lot of people talk about that game, they're like, oh man, you kicked like, what, five on Anzac Day, your first game? You know, it's like very Australian that they start blowing things up to be like bigger and bigger. And I'm like, yeah, I did kick five, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, you just kind of like, hey, it's your story. You're telling it. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, the whole day was a bit of a whirlwind. And then like coming off, and I remember um, something I've never talked about, I guess, was Anthony Rocker, who was, you know, one of my coaches that really kind of showed me AFL and taught me through the early stages of my career. And he just came up to me and he's like, let's make sure this isn't a one-off. And um, in my mind, I kind of was like so excited about everything going on. I was like, what the fuck's he talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then kind of you get back to the rooms, you kind of think about it. You're like, oh, okay, like, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's a great story and everything and now, but it's like, this can't be a flash in the pan. Make sure it's a, a long career and this is just the start of it. So really good advice from from Pebs in the moment, um, which was amazing. But yeah, it's just like, it's a credit to, to him and, in Craig and it's like every time I play and do something good like it's it's just cool to have them I guess like someone I can kind of go back to and thank and be like yeah they're the reason I'm here like I don't exist I don't have the experiences I've had without Craig and Pebs and Derek Hines and these people that you know stuck their neck out for me and the the times that they didn't really have to and it's cool to kind of have these memories with them to say like they're the reason I'm being successful and like all the credit kind of goes to them I'm just there you know doing my job but without them guiding me in the right directions throughout my career, I don't I don't get to a hundred games. So it's um it's cool. But yeah, on, on the day it was kind of crazy. And even after the game, I remember um walking the streets trying to go find my parents and trying to go have dinner with them and stuff. And I had all these Essendon people come up to me and they're like, I fucking hate Collingwood. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but what you did today was amazing. Like something I'm so incredible to be happy to be like a part of and to see it. And Essendon was going through their saga stuff and everything else and weren't probably the best team that they had you know, ever put out on the park. But uh, it was cool to see fans from an opposing team who hated Collingwood so much still be appreciative and like, um, yeah, like just so complimentary of the, I guess, thing that transpired. So it wasn't just smooth sailing from that point on. It was mm. game one, you know, the fairy tale start 98 games ago. It's game one of the rest of your career. Yeah. And a lot of people start to then go, okay, like start to pull you kind of down type mentality. How much did you feel like there was a chip on your shoulder that you have something to prove over the course of your career? Oh, uh, Every day I walked into the club, I had something to prove. You can be American coming into a club not knowing what AFL is and no one's going to give you any time of day thinking that you're going to be successful. No, no reason for them to think that was going to be successful. So, I mean, I really struggled with it for the first probably like three or four years of trying to prove to everyone that I gave a shit about AFL and I was going to be successful in this and it was a grind mentally at times and Craig... Craig talked about it and stuff and breaking down on the field and stuff and him kind of consoling me through those kind of times which was amazing but yeah I remember the first year like I played that Anzac day and played maybe six or seven games after that and then Trav came back into the into the fold and I essentially took a week off because my mental health was just shit ass like I went to Dalesford I think it was I went to Dalesford with a, um, a girlfriend at the time and just kind of got away and I think Jesse came back Jesse White came back into the team and um, I just was all over it mentally. Like I just broke down. I think it was after Carlton game. I went into the rooms and, and we've got like a taping kind of corner and I just went in there. I just broke down and just like started crying. I was like, I can't fucking take this. Like I'm so far away from any kind of support. I wasn't playing perfect at the time. It was really hard on myself and I still am today. But that was kind of one of those really like learning moments in my career of like being able to deal with adversity and like people were on my ass about not playing well and things like that and the media pressure and everything else that came with it. And I did, yeah, I had to take like a couple of weeks off just because I wasn't mentally in the right place. And I've never really told anyone about it, but yeah, I, I got I went away and I came back and played a bit of VFL and then continued on with my career. But I think that was like one of those learning points of a real kind of like point in your career of whether it's going to go one way or the other and whether, you know, you kind of saw the future and wanted to go through the stresses of AFL life and having a career in it. Cause it's not, it's not always rainbows and daisies and and a beautiful time. There's the pressure that comes with it and everything else and not being able to get away from it. And you just have to sit down and say, do I want to make the sacrifices to have a, a successful and full AFL career? And luckily enough, you know, I, I made the decision to uh, to make those and, and continue on. It's very rarely sunshine and rainbows, even mm -hmm. for the best players out there. Now, you said your mom 
said that you probably describes you as like someone that won't give up, like someone yeah. that just keeps forging ahead. What was it that kind of got you back on track in those situations, being so far from home and not really having a family support network around? Yeah, we used to, was, like I said before, a lot of it goes to, credit goes to Derek Hines, Anthony Rocker, and um, Craig McRae. Like Craig used to come over every single year for Thanksgiving. That was a massive thing for me. And I was in a shitty two bedroom apartment. Like, and we're makeshifting an Ikea table into a Thanksgiving table and putting all these turkey and everything else down. And um, yeah, it's just moments like that. Well, like Craig doesn't need to do that, but he goes out of his way because he knows that what's, that's what makes me comfortable. And that's a, a big deal for me. And to have him there meant a lot. And, you know, Peb's, I remember so many times going over to his house and hanging out with his family and like getting to know them and just having dinners with them. And that was kind of my, you know, home away from home was going to his place and, and looking after me. And, you know, you look at so many players that come into the, the system and, you know, not every coach can devote that kind of time and that, that kind of effort into, into players, but they did. And like, they kind of saw, I guess, um, the opportunity in myself and where I would go in life. And I'm forever grateful for what they've done because those tough times were made easier by them being there for me and me being able to trust them. Cause you, you gotta think you go into a country, into a, a football club and you've got no inner circle to bitch and complain about things whenever there's shit. And like, you don't want to complain to a coach cause then you look like you don't give a shit or whatever it is, you know? And like, you just don't have your like thing to, everyone goes to work, they go home, they usually release their stress and they go home to their partner mm-hmm. or their family or wherever it is. I didn't have that. And like Craig and Anthony were the only ones I really could. So to have them there and knowing they're in my corner and be able to kind of talk to them through things of the tough times and, you know, I guess let out a bit of steam whenever I needed to, and then not, you know, refer it on to a coach that was going to be detrimental to my career was something that, you know, it's the inner circle and the people you really trust at the end of the day. And they were, they were those for me and continue to be. So I think then that was kind of like the thing that got me back on track was just having them as a support group. And I've got a lot of friends outside of football. People always ask me, oh, are you best friends with everyone at the club? And I'm like, I'm friends with everyone at the club. Don't get me wrong. But like my weekends aren't probably spent with them. Yeah. Uh, besides playing on the weekend, obviously yeah. like playing football. But <laughs> yeah. um, I've never really done many trips overseas with them. Um, I've never been a guy that probably goes out to lunch and coffees with the boys and stuff like that. I've always kind of done my own thing. And I've had my support group away from football because football takes up so much of my life. And yeah. There's the media side of things and things I do there and the more attention from that and everything else that comes with it. And I've found an amazing group of friends internationally that have come over here from the States and Vietnam and Sweden and all this kind of stuff that those are my people I probably hang out with and those are the people I, I put my time to. And yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting thing because you, you're an American that plays IFL and you're so foreign. You don't have any experiences that are similar to anyone else there really. Mm. And you always feel like you're a little bit the odd one out. Most of those guys, if not all of those guys, are on a very similar journey. Like a lot Mm -hmm. of them go through high school, like with the idea of getting drafted, go through the draft, get picked up from 18, and they go through the whole journey by themselves. Like some might drop short, some might get rookie listed, but Mm -hmm. the the path is pretty similar. So it same goal. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be very hard for you to come in outside of that mold and just try to slot straight in and and fit in with you know a bunch of guys that haven't experienced anything that you've experienced. And I mean, no one's really experienced anything that you've experienced. Now I will touch on, seems you're mentioning all of these guys, Eddie Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you've had like a really tight relationship with him over the journey. And mm. it sounds like over your time, he's done a lot for you. How is that relationship with Eddie and, and what's it mean to you? Yeah, old dad. Um, he's a legend. Him and Carla, his wife and his kids, Joe and Xander. It's uh, even like over the weekend, he was up at um, at the Carlton game, obviously as you expect Ed to be. Um, and he was up in his box, and uh, I remember walking off the ground, just kind of giving a wave to him. And yeah, he's been massive. Like I remember when I first met Ed, I had no idea who he was. Like I was getting recruited, and he's in the room, and he's talking about this, that, and pumping up Collingwood, such and such. My brother and I get in the taxi after the meeting, and he's sitting there, on, or sorry, getting an Uber, whatever's after the meeting, there's a taxi in front of us, and his face is on the back of it for who wants to be a millionaire ad. <laughs> and I've gone to my brother, I go, is he a big deal? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, Eddie's like one of the biggest media moguls in Australia. Um, so that was kind of like wild, and just like me and my ignorance coming in here, you know, like I had no idea who Nathan Buckley was, I didn't know mm. who any of these people were, and I just kind of, you know, was just like, all right, sweet, let's just figure it out as we go uh but yeah eddie's been he's been amazing like he's someone that on a weekly i'll probably send a message to and you know talk about the game or talk about life and things like that and he's a guy that's one of the most probably busy people in melbourne like but he's always shown time for me 
Um, and every single year during Christmas, he's always looked after me and, you know, had me over for dinner and stuff. Cause obviously I'm that far away from home and he's just one of those people that's always been a support network and someone that's always, you know, helped me out. Like I understand what's happening in the media and stuff with him, but I think I always try to judge people on my own, um, interactions and he's just always been there for support. And yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's amazing to have those people there because like you, you value those people so much. I remember back in the day, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure my eye injuries and stuff, like he was the only person from the Colonial Football Club that checked in on me on a regular basis. And it's like, this guy is the most, like, he's the busiest out of anyone else there. And he's the one sending me a message, making sure I'm okay, asking if I need food or whatever it was. And it just, it's just kind of those moments where you're really in the, you're really in the dark times. You realize who really is in your corner. And that was someone I think that I became so much closer with and so much more grateful to have in my life after that experience. And he was just the person that kind of always made sure I was all right. And you just kind of, yeah, you have those moments of, of depression and everything else. And um, you realize he's the he's one of those people that's always going to be in your corner. Yeah. There's a lot of people that will always have their opinions of Ed without knowing that's understandable. Who, yeah, who he is. Like what's happened. But, but yeah, there there is certain things like that that, there's plenty of stories like that out there from mm. times that he's reached out and helped help people. And yeah, it's great to see that the the relationship that you two have, um, and it obviously means a fair bit. Um, now it's one of the standout highlights to me, 2016. So still really young in your footballing journey. Yep. Uh, you get a ball straight up the guts, Mason Cox just outside 50, and then a paddock. Oh, fuck. <laughs> They're all, <laughs> the guys in front of you, uh, it was so Collingwood v Geelong. They're all kind of running away from you, covering up leading I'm options. I'm hoping they're chasing me down, so I don't have to do this, but yeah. And off you go, run, take a bounce, slot one from probably about 40 on the run. What was going through your mind that whole journey? Uh, yeah, ball gets switched fat side. I'm in paddocks and I'm going, shit. <laughs> like, and it's not like you can come off the mark. There was that much space you had to take. You had to take the mark. Or sorry, you had to play on the mark. There's those moments in your career you don't forget. And it's like the funny moments and all that kind of stuff. And I remember just sitting there and I'm I'm going, I'm going to have to bounce the ball for the first time. I think everyone is thinking it. And we have all gone, has he been taught this yet? <laughs> and literally, I think it was maybe like weeks or months prior, Pendles taught me like, there's little things that people teach you throughout your career, right? And Pendles taught me, he's like, you have to bounce it on the laces because the laces get more grip on the ground before it pops back up and doesn't skid out like it would whenever it's wet. Smart. Yeah, smart man, Pendles. And um, I just remember getting it and going like, all right, cool. This is it. Bang. Uh, as soon as I let it go, I was like, oh, fuck, that's good. That's good. <laughs> and it bounced back up. And then you go look up. And then the players like Trav Varco, I'll never forget. Trav Varco has gone and he's lengthened to the goal square. Their player, who I was hoping came to me, goes with Trav. Yep. I've gone, <laughs> Fuck more paddocks <laughs> it's a real dropping off the three-point shooter that yeah. can't shoot it's, it stuff. is it's a real disrespectful kind of thing right he goes back and Trav's kind of he's like kind of in between so Trav's in the, the goal square and like I, I had the bounce and I kind of run in I'm like I look back Motlop's given up he's he's gone this ought to be a sight to see yeah. and he's gone he's gone back there so I'm just jogging in and I, I'll slot the goal and then I think thank fuck because I would have got the biggest spray from Trav Varco in the uh, goal square but yeah, that was that was a that was a funny moment of being like, you know what? There's some things you know that I, I can pick up that probably aren't part of my repertoire as a recommend that you would think that I can figure out on the run and sort it out. And that's one of those moments of like doing something for the first time. And it was so funny. Like I think everyone was giving me shit after it, thinking like, I there's no chance in hell I thought that was going to happen. And yeah, I think speaking of Trav Varka, you can see there's a moment when it, he can see it's going through, and he just opens his arms out and throws his head up like. Looking up to the heavens, like miracles happen. Miracles do happen. Uh, so I just want to touch on this real briefly. But you have bounced the ball a handful of times in your career, and it's you four. I want to yeah, say, you yeah, you said that you could remember all of them. Yeah. Now I want you to run through them for us. So the Geelong one. Uh, I think we've got one. Uh, I want to say Gold Coast on the wing came in as a substitute. No one out there. Paddocks gets the ball kicked to me. I've gone shit. Got to bounce it here. Um, Gold Coast bouncing goal on the run. Gold Coast bouncing goal on the run, COVID times. That's the other one. And then there's one more that was Fremantle, maybe? I can't remember. You did there's kick a goal one. on the run for yeah. Fremantle, but I don't know if you bounced it or not. It was a bounce. There's another bounce. I can't remember it. But they're, they're all, they're, it's funny that like that little thing sticks out, a bounce. 
And it's yeah. like, of all the things in the 100 games or 99 games, whoever it is, like anytime I bounce the ball, sticks out. It's just rare stuff. Now, I, I guess we're probably in a great spot to just ask you a few little quick fire ones. Yeah. What is your favorite goal from your career? Favorite goal? Oof. That's a tough one. Um, fifth goal, Queen's birthday. That's up there. That was through. like, uh, took a mark about 50 out, I think, on the angle, goes through for the bag. Big day, Queen's birthday, lock and seal, three votes, get the trophy, top deal. That's knew nice. it too. That's like nice. knew it. That was good fun. Uh, I want to say that was the fifth. Uh, the Melbourne goal a few, I think it was like a year ago. Out, yep. of, the out of the center, center bounce. bounce. Yep. Didn't do anything. Gone. Didn't do anything. Literally hit out, bang, I'm jogging in the middle, just the dickhead on the outside. One person gets tackled, another person flicks it over the top, and I'm just there. And I'm just like, the ball just gets in my in, into my lap and then just kick the goal. That was a good one. Um, on the boundary versus Geelong snap. Yeah, that's a good one. One I'll never forget, though, is um, Port Adelaide in the corner trying to do a check side or banana. Mm. And it was like, maybe like second year, I want to say. I'm in the corner on the boundary, and I'll never forget because I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm like a year or two into it, right? So I'd not done many of these, but I was like, fuck it. <laughs> like, There's no expectation. Let's, it, no expectation. No one's thinking a chance this is going in. Even to the point where Pindles, never forget this, comes over cheekily, acts like he's trying to talk me through. He's going, give me the receive, give me the handball receive, give me the handball receive. <laughs> me, the audacity oh, goes, my God. I got this, Pindles. Now you got to keep it. Step off, all right? Spray it. <laughs> Oh, rough. I, Miss, I think I went through for a point. Uh, and Pigeons just gives me the daggers after. I'm just looking away like, nope, don't see it. Don't see it. Don't see it, Pendles. Geez, yeah, man. retrospectively, should have gave the handball receive. Um, My favorite, top mm. of mind, Richmond, but not prelim, 2019, in traffic. There's oh. about five of them around you. No one comes at you. Sells candy. Candy, 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 candy. <laughs> and then just slots it, snaps it through. It's like, come on, leave him alone. Leave him alone. <laughs> oh, it's just out of nowhere. But that one is one that it's, it doesn't get the brought up as much. Cool too. Yeah, just a goal. celebration around a Kiss FM, getting around it, donating money for a good cause. That was good fun. And out the back, just yeah. the cheeky one on the run. Through, like barreled someone into Jamie. Jamie turns on, what the fuck is that all about? <laughs> then he's yelling, kick the goal. He's like, oh, okay. Now, this is probably in one of the more obscure things, and I assume you get asked about this a fair bit, but Joe Biden meeting yeah. the president. Well, he was the, the, he was the vice at the president yep. at the time. But how did that all come about? And <laughs> what was he saying during the game? Oh, he had no idea what was going on. It was what we what he called murder ball, which is essentially we called it something else that's inappropriate to say on the podcast. Um, being from Texas, but it's essentially tackling with the, with the ball. It's like a game in you know recess, whatever everyone would play. But now that that was a wild experience. One of the coolest things I think experience was that's come from AFL was mm-hmm. that. Um, dad knew before I did because like I, I told my dad I was like, oh, the U.S. consulate asked me who I've got a really good relationship. They're like. We need to get a background check on you. We've got a high-profile person coming into the country. I had no idea who it was at that time. They hadn't released it. And they can't release these things until I kind of pretty close to it. So the media got onto it. Dad knew that that happened. And then my dad, who listens to like Triple M in the morning. And it's like, yeah, I think this is like what, 3 p.m. U.S. time, like 6 a.m. Australian time. He's listening to like Triple M in the morning. They said, oh, Joe Biden's coming. So my dad calls me at like 8 a.m. And he's like, Mason, are you are you hosting Joe Biden? Is that who it is? You know, I know you got the clearance ball up on. I was like, I don't fucking know. Like, hey, he's, he's, smart. Talking about? he's smart man, old Phil Cox. <laughs> and uh, surely enough, I get a call maybe an hour later, and they're like, Hey, just a heads up, this is going into the media. Joe Biden's coming to town. That's who you're kind of looking after. So to say that you kind of like that was crazy, and I don't think people here understood how much of a motorcade and experience and everything else that comes with the person of that kind of status coming to Australia. They shut down the streets. You know, they've got. Two uh, like two massive airplanes just full of equipment to bring in just for one person. Obviously, there's the people that come with them, but like just to show one person there, and um, that was an amazing kind of life moment I'll never forget. Like hosting a vice president, that's pretty crazy to think. And um, he had no idea what was going on. They had the Secret Service, nicest people they ever made, but one of them like full trench coat, earpiece, like Matrix who you would picture to be secret service was not trying to blend in whatsoever yeah. just stood next to 
you know, uh, next to our aisle the whole time or a row. And it was just, it, the whole thing was pretty wild because you just don't realize, I guess, how much that goes with it. And like there was secret service everywhere. They had swept the whole MCG beforehand to make sure there's no issues. Like there was police, like 50 police, policemen and women, you know, outside of the room to make sure there's no issues. Like it was crazy. And then there was like secret service, like dotted in the seats that we didn't know. Secret, secret, secret service. Secret service, yeah. And then like we go in and then there was like different, and then they had like a swap of secret service at like halftime or Jeez. like quarter time or something like that. And there was like so many things in motion behind the scenes just for this one person to be there. And it was so cool. And yeah, that's that's a memory like that's up there with anything I've done in the IFL field. Um, and shout out to Collingwood because I had to have a very stern conversation with them whenever I was told that I was going to host the vice president. We were playing a big game, Frankston Dolphins in the VFL that week. Fins up, fins up. Fins up. Fins up to old Franger. Um, and yeah, so I'd asked the club essentially permission to skip the game to go host the vice president. Get a note, from, note from Joe being like, please let him, <laughs> please like let him come out yet. and play. <laughs> He's a citizen of us, not yet you. Um and I remember Neil Baum was the GM at the time and I had to, because I knew Bucks is a very stern man. I love Bucks, but I knew Neil Baum was a bit softer. You know, I could <laughs> get into Neil Baum a bit. So went into Neil's office and I said, look, this opportunity has come up. This is what's happening. You know, is this something that I could do? Skip this Frankston game. And he goes, I'll have a conversation with Bucks. He goes and have a conversation with Bucks. Bucks comes back to me. He goes, I understand what this means. We'll let you have it. So um, credit to the club, the coach, Neil, and uh, sorry, Bucks and Neil at the time for letting me do that because it was a, a moment I'll never forget in my life and really cool just really cool I still got the pin I've got a little coin from him and stuff like that too and now he's president of the United States and um, it's just a crazy cool life experience story you can tell people and the secret service couldn't have stopped you if you wanted to I literally <laughs> could not have been more more immobile in my life because I knew there was a sniper rifle at my forehead no quick the movements the whole time it was legit though it was me and Matt just sitting there like just, you know, like in the airplanes, you have this armrest question marks. Like he got the armrest for sure. Yeah. <laughs> there was no doubt Joe Biden was getting the armrest. And it was just one of those things like it was so like nerve wracking that kind of made it awkward. And like I had never been in a position of something like that, right? Like that was next tier, top tier type stuff that was going on. And I just felt so, he made it really comfortable. He's like, as far as charisma, he is an amazing human. I get why he's a politician because he just fits the bill really well. Mm. He can maneuver in, in and out of um, conversations a bit like Eddie does, you know, and um, he makes everyone feel valued that he talks to, which is really, it's a very, very good and tough skill to learn. And um, he was really, he was really good at that. But I still, to this day, think the reason he came out to Australia, obviously he opened up a part of the hospital because his son had brain cancer, I think. Uh, was the reasoning he opened that up with the ribbon cutting but another reason he brought his granddaughters and they wanted to see a koala and a kangaroo um, <laughs> because at half time like oh where's the like you know where's the granddaughters over there and he's like oh they're in Hillsville already like petting kangaroos and koalas they wanted to go see and, and to this day I still think that was a main draw factor for him to come out here you should have went out and did that one now from one experience of but, go to the Hillsville or the uh, Hillsville. stepdaughters or the, <laughs> the granddaughters <laughs> Okay, just want to clear that up. <laughs> now, one experience of Joe Biden at the G yep. to another experience, Tennant Creek in the mm, middle of nowhere. nowhere. <laughs> now, amazing journey. And we went on this trip together. Yeah. And it was it's always a real eye-opener. And anyone that works at the club, it's like, you got to get on this trip. Yeah. Talk to us through that trip and the effect that it had on you. Yeah, it's it feels like you're in a different country. It really does. And the vast difference in the way of life between you know, the city to the outback is, it's pretty crazy. And it was, it was a very, you know, like confronting at times, but also like, I remember there's a, a lady there that um, took us through and talked about some of the, the negative things that were happening in the community and the tough things that were happening because of situations. And um, yeah, it was, it was very eye opening. It really was. And I, I think just cause I had gone straight to Melbourne, I was just known the city life really. I didn't realize just exactly what was happening outside of, you know, the bubble of Melbourne. And um I've always been a massive advocate for the indigenous community and had some amazing experiences with them over the years. But I think that Tennant Creek one was the one that really opened my eyes as to um, one, the power I think that AFL has as athletes and what we can do to, to help influence people in the right way. Uh, being in those very remote communities uh, was it like Waterloo Downs. We were talking mm. about, we had to like walk through like floodwaters to get to yeah, and had a tinny there. The road. 
I remember sitting on the hood of the the Land Cruiser, like going through it. There's just like these really remote places, and you know, the one thing that brought everyone together was was sport, was football, and um, you just realize. I think that 2018 trip to Tenet was just one of those realizations of just the power you, and impact you can have as a sports person that kind of made me realize it. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing that that got me really invested into the indigenous side of things. And um, like I said, I've gone up to the Tiwi Islands and done community work up there and done community work all the way from Gold Coast all the way up to the very tip in Bamaga uh, up in Cape York. And something I'm very passionate about to um, to help change the futures for the better for some of these uh, some of these people that are you know, living a bit tough or living in remote communities and, um, you know, to try to give them opportunities elsewhere. It's, uh, you know, something I'm very passionate about. So yeah, that tenant Creek definitely changed me. Um, yeah, just some amazing people you meet there and, uh, just what the, uh, the community does and how sport brings everyone together is it's such a powerful thing. Like I could talk about Tiwi. They were nuts mm. up there. Like walked into the, like there was kids and they found out that I was there. We're waiting for us at the dock because we went fishing, waiting for us at the dock every single day. And there was kids walking the fence line trying to get a glimpse of me whenever there's crocs in the water. Like yeah. just some stuff you just wouldn't think in Melbourne would be happening in the same country, right? And then you go to the local pub and they're, they're throwing the Collingwood theme song on for like an hour straight <laughs> on loop just whenever I'm there and like people are hanging off you and kids are hanging off you and they can't believe it, you know? And, talking about, oh, I'm your always, you know, uncle and, you know, brother and all this kind of stuff. And um, it's just such a cool experience to be in these remote communities that like, you know, that is what they live and breathe as IFL. And like, I didn't know it existed, you know? And I, yeah. I don't know if I've ever told this story of, um, there's a lady I met on that trip up to the TV and she was uh, one of the, the last elders, I think, uh, or one of the, the living elders of their tribe. And she was there, um, met her very lovely lady, older, older lady, and um, I've gone back to Melbourne. And then Willie Rioli Jr. actually sent me this, and a few other people sent me this. And it was, um, she had unfortunately passed away. And that he was telling me the story of how she flew an American flag outside of her house, mad Collingwood fan, flew an American flag outside of her house because she like was a massive fan of myself. And I was thinking, me impacting someone in a remote community on the Tiwi Islands enough for them to fly an American flag outside of their house makes no freaking sense whatsoever. But this lady was the most lovely human. I met her when I was up there and she, like I said, she unfortunately passed away and then he sent me this photo and I was like, I was blown away and it was her casket and the casket was in Collingwood Stripes then had the logo in the middle and then it had Mason Cox 46 on it. It's crazy. On a casket in the Tiwi Islands and I've asked them, they said it's fine for me to tell the story, but um, that was a moment of just like, yeah, there's a 2018 in Tennant Creek, but I think that was another moment where I was like, holy smokes, like what we do, we probably take for granted of like mm. what we do every single day. And it's pretty phenomenal how much people love it and breathe it and just live it. And you talk about, you know, bleeding for your team and stuff like that. Like there's, people that that is their life and that is their happiness that is their joy that is the one thing they look forward to every single week is watching Collingwood play and it just makes you have a different perspective to footy it really does and that was yeah that was one of those moments that I'll never forget and it's just like a crazy life experience for me to think back on and yeah you leave that you, just the joy in their faces seeing their faces mm. like genuinely light up especially you because it, you're even more foreign you're like <laughs> over two meters tall they're yeah. like sitting on your shoulders and stuff running around but yeah it's also like a carrot to get them to go to school and keep yep. attendance up and it's it's genuinely life out there like they live and breathe it and it's yeah it, it, it is awesome to go out there and see firsthand how much it does mm. mean to them because it gets thrown around a lot. Like footy is everything to some people, but yeah. like it genuinely is out there and it makes a massive difference. Those trips. Now, another, we're getting into some good games and we actually have <laughs> proof that you yeah. can play more than one good game per what? year. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell the people on social media that? <laughs> now, 2018, oh. uh, Queen's birthday, shout out to the OG, prayers up. <laughs> Prayers out to the queen. Five goals, still your best mm. to date. Goal holes, yep. Yeah, you. I go, have kicked a bag. You, yeah, you've kicked a bag. You go on to win the Neil Danaher medal uh, trophy. Trophy, yeah. But yeah, talk us through that game. 
it's one of those things like Brody and I were playing the Ruck against Max Gone, and that was kind of one of those moments, I guess, going against one of the bigger Ruckmans and then one of the better Ruckmans in the comp, whether or not it would stack up. And um, luckily enough, that that worked out. And um, there's another moment I'll talk about this because in the Melbourne game, right? So let's talk about sliding doors moments. In my third year, um, 2017 it would have been, very last game we play Melbourne. Melbourne's has to win to get into the eight. We win, we knock them out of the eight. We weren't making finals, right? Lyndon Dunn goes nuts on the, Dunn <laughs> on the goes siren. Nuts. And I remember after the game, he goes nuts. And I remember going over, actually, I remember going over to Dunny and I just said to him, I said, man, I appreciate it. It's been a good ride. Um, I appreciate all the help you've kind of given me and, and whatnot and just kind of giving thanks. And he was kind of like, what are you talking about? You know, and I was at that point, I'd, um, I kind of already had something in the mix as far as me going to another team. And um, because the club hadn't given me a contract, another team had come to the to the, the table and given me one. And I, I thought that was the last game I was going to play for Collingwood. Um, I remember getting to the end and going to the post to post match. And that was the wild thing is, is like that was the big question mark: Can we play Brody Grundy and Mason Cox in the same team? In that game, we dominated Melbourne. We won. Everything was on the line for them. We ended up winning that game, um, and it was kind of proof that we could. And the club. I had this moment of oh shit like this might be the future who knows and I hadn't had a contract there from the club I had a contract from another team and I was and mentally I was, I was out the door and I was like it's been it's been a good ride and, you know I'm going to move on to another chapter in life and I remember getting to the end of the game you talk about um, people in your life and Eddie you always talk funny we always talk about the funny moment of him finding out and he came up to me and I just said look I appreciate all the help you've had over the years and um, everything you've kind of given to me and the support you've kind of given to me and he's like what are you talking about what are you talking you're not leaving us are you and I was like Ed I'm not going to say anything but like it's just you know I just want to say thank you so much for everything you've done and uh, he talks about going home and I'll talk to his family about this but he goes home and throws his jacket on the couch he's like what the fuck have we done are you kidding me we're losing Mason Mason's not going to fucking stay with us oh, and he goes on this huge tyrant for the whole night and he's on the phone with the, you know with all the different people at the club saying you can't fucking get rid of him blah 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 um, and yeah, like in my in my head, I'd already kind of made the, the commitment. I'd verbally committed to another team. And there was um, some things that happened behind the scenes around visas and stuff that I'll talk more about at some point in my life. But um, things happened. And over the next few weeks, I guess, I don't know if Eddie made phone calls. I don't, <laughs> I don't know the details the to this. Detail. Um, but miraculously, all of a sudden, the club came to, um, came to me with a, a contract that matched the other one. Nice. And that was uh, the reason I stayed. So... Yeah, it happened very quickly. Um, but I think that sliding doors moment of me coming back into the team, um, it was, in my mind, the last game I was ever going to play for Collingwood. And I played really well with Brody, and they they saw the future of us playing in a tandem. And that kind of got me to, to stay at the club, which is kind of crazy to think. And some massive things happened throughout the 2018 season. I will mm. say that Queen's birthday was my last game. Yeah. And it didn't look like... A lot was going to happen with Collingwood to that point. I was like, oh, I'm getting off this sinking ship. But there's also something else bigger at play than that. Murray Swinton, who came through the club, who was suffering from MND, was just a massive Collingwood man, got around yeah. with his scrapbook full of Collingwood <laughs> moments and stuff. Had a really powerful impact on the club through that 2018 uh, season. Mm. Murray was one of those people, like you'd, been diagnosed with MND, was going through this rough trial of treatment and everything else. Um, to have him there as part of it, we really kind of took him in as our own, his family also. And, um, you know, you talked about the, the scrapbooks and stuff like that we talked about and everything else. And it just one of those people I just loved calling. I just loved it. And that, I think, brought us back to just, like I said before, the influence we can have on people and how much it meant to other people and uh, our fans and it really kind of brought us to this realization of it's bigger than just us as a group it's you know we bring the community with us and everyone else and it provides so much happiness for so many people and murray was a big reason i think we had success on queen's birthday don't get me wrong but also throughout the rest of the year and we we put quotes up on the board from him um you know throughout the year and talking about like how fortunate we should be or sorry how great grateful we should be of what we've been able to do and you know, the opportunities we saw in front of us. So Murray was a big reason, I think, for a lot of success in that year. And yeah, he came through the club. We did a story on him and mm. he was very selfless. Like he wasn't really thinking. Yeah. He was thinking about everyone else before himself. Um, and it, yeah, such a touching story. Obviously, Bucks went down the slide wearing uh, Murray's firefighting kit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it definitely had a big impact on Bucks as well. So yeah, a very touching story. And and. 
just a reminder to support M and D. Uh, the Dana Dana Her Foundation. Get on the get on the beanies ahead of this year's King's Birthday game. Now the big one heading into the prelim, mm. 2018. It all culminated in essentially you stopping Richmond from getting the four feet. We all say, yeah, it's you got teammates or whatever. Whatever people say, it's all not in this case. It was you. Mason Cox. Nah, Jordy had a good game too. Was there anything different about this game that set it up to be what it was? Or did it all just fall into place at the right time? I kind of think it like it kind of marries up to the rest of my career of just being an underdog at every point. And that's what we were on the day. Like no one expected us to win. I think Richmond had that many games they won in a row at the MCG, blah, 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 this massive streak. And I won the two previous years in the grand final and you know, all this kind of stuff. No one gave us a chance. And I was like, we were playing pretty well, but like obviously Richmond was just at their peak, their peak of their powers, and um, yeah, it was it was interesting. Like I think going into it, like I had an epidural on my back the week before, so that kind of put some. I had some issues, I guess, health wise and whatnot, and got the epidural, and that kind of made me feel back to normal. And then kind of was like, well, you got nothing to lose here. Like no one picks you, no one thinks you're gonna win. So you're playing against arguably one of the best defensive lineups, mm, like going around, like Alex Rance, Grimes, and Grimes everyone else and that was all there. That. Like it was, they're a good, good outfit. Um, and yeah, it just was one of those things. Like you just the whole. It wasn't just myself either. It was the whole team was in flow state. Like it was just, it was wild. Like is similar to essentially the first half of the grand final until we lost, but. Uh, everything seemed to be working and everyone was clicking. Everyone was on the same page. And I think I was probably just the benefactor of that. Like just being the person in the forward line that we kind of looked to, to, to kick a goal and, you know, was on, on the day and kind of got, I guess the, uh, the credit in the sense of, um, everyone else's good doings. So, Hey, you look on those games and the career defining moments and stuff like that. And everyone will always mention it, which is awesome to have that, I guess, in your, um, in your memory bank. But, yeah, it was it was a wild scenario. I hope, like mom and dad were there, and I talk about like one of my favorite memories from the day is I used to kind of I can't do it anymore. Security doesn't allow me, but I used to go up to the edge of the MCG at the race after games and just see like the MCG is an empty kind of like coliseum, and it's a, it's a it's a like kind of a, a weird feeling, an eerie feeling, but like really cool at the same time. And I used to do that as just a coming down moment from like the craziness and the you know, the atmosphere and everything else from games and you're up all night, you know, thinking about this, that, and the other. And that was kind of my way of just like taking a breath was going up there and just kind of looking around and being like, life's pretty fucking crazy. And I uh, went up there and the thing I remember probably the most from the whole game is like being up there and my mom, I wasn't aware of it until she came, she had walked up the race and put her arm around me and she just kind of said like, you know, I'm so proud of you and, and what you've been able to do. It's pretty crazy where life takes you kind of thing. And um, that's that's the number one. Memory. People can talk about goals you kick, talking shit to whoever it is, this and that. But that's the one thing I remember the most. And probably tells you how much, um, yeah, that means to me as far as family. But yeah, that, that was a, a career-defining moment, I guess. And to think that like a guy who was four years into knowing what the sport was is about to go play into a grand final is just absurd. And just the absolute storm that came after that week of just everything that is a grand final was such a learning moment for me, I think. And how was the attention post that? You're playing the biggest sport in Australia mm. on the biggest club in the land and you just tore to pieces the prelim final. Mm. How was the attention after that going into a grand final? Oh, it's, it's wild. Like just... Yeah, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it, to be honest. I remember we had our media day at the club. Um, I think I was there for an extra hour and a half or two hours after doing interviews with people. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't happy with that because I was trying to focus on the game. And it was just kind of this whole thing of like trying to make, the club was trying to make the most of the opportunity of being in a grand final. I understand that. But also the players were, um, you know, in a unique standpoint of like just, you know, the situation of beating Richmond going into grand final versus West Coast. And, you know, it had been what 18 years since the last grand final and being such a big club brings a lot of attention so yeah it was it was a whirlwind of a week like so much happening the brothers started like flying in and then you know surprise the parents and mom and dad were there and then um trying to organize tickets and everything that goes with it and then they got the parade and all it's just literally every day is like something new and it was just like just chaos absolute chaos and it was cool though like i mean i look back and so fortunate to be able to experience that like i always kind of say it is Everyone talks about that year. Oh, you're so close to like winning the whole thing. Boy, oh boy, you know, you're one kick away and all this kind of shit. But to be honest, like me from an experience standpoint, it's like I've experienced everything but carrying a gold medal around my neck. 
And life is about experiences, you know. I, I, I can tell you most people have probably won a grand final and have a premiership medal, don't see it every day. Mm. I probably would think about that, you know, every day of like my career and what I've been able to do and some of the experiences that have come through it. So I, I'm very fortunate in being able to experience that. Would I have loved to win it? Yes. Like, will I hopefully win one in the future? Yes. But looking back, I can't be upset with the opportunities that have come my way from the decisions I've made. So. I mean, looking back, I mean, I could have signed with Richmond when I first came to the country and I could be sitting here with three medals, <laughs> maybe even four. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, there was one piece. We won't touch too much on the uh, grand final. <laughs> mm, don't remember it. Um, Lock that out of the memory bank. You did talk about seeing your old man while you were uh, up on stage just oh, after the parade. Oh, my gosh, is the funniest thing. So you go out in the parade, right? So that parade ends, you go up onto the stage. The captains both touch the cup and hold it up, whatever it is, show it to the fans, you know, and then it's the awkward who lets go of it last bullshit, whatever. I get on stage and I'll never forget because I knew my parents were there. My brothers are coming to town. Like it was a big chaos. And then like I'm scanning, you know, trying to find my parents in the crowd and I see my dad and my dad is wearing one of the, the most horrendous kits you've ever seen. He's got the big Coxzilla shirt, <laughs> which is the hilarious. So Love that. And then he's got this like hair piece that like is like, it's like a Mohawk 360 around the head. We'll show it on social, but he's got this like hair piece up and he's got, he's just grinning from ear to ear. It is like, he's loving it more than I am. Like he is just living the absolute dream, this man. And it was, it was one of the funniest moments of my life. Cause I, I couldn't stop laughing the whole time I was up there. I was like, that's my father. <laughs> like, <laughs> Doesn't everyone know it? <laughs> everyone knew it. Everyone knew it. He's like, yeah. He's so hyped. Man. He reminded me of the photos, hilarious, but it right. reminded me of like a preschooler going to primary school for the first time, yeah. like just proud as punch, just, just proud as punch. It was great, great to see. Now, let's flick through the, the, the tail end of this because we're getting long. Yeah, there's a bit of a downside coming out of the back end of this, and it's your mm. eye injuries. Yeah, now injuries because there's ridiculous. a whole heap of them, they're yeah. like hardly hanging in there inside your skull. <laughs> Uh, so talk us through this. You copped finger to the eye, went all the way to the back of the skull. Yeah. You got detached retinas coming out the wazoo, dark rooms, laying on your back, can't mm. do anything, can't see anyone, frustrating recovery because it's not just like a standard ankle or an, yeah. like a hamstring or something, it's your eyes, and also fearing that this could be it for – the future yep. of your football, but also your vision. Like there's a lot going on in, in your head. What's this roller coaster journey been about? And this is before we get to your stuff about playing in goggles in front of hundreds of thousands <laughs> of people. Yeah. The eye injury by far most depressing dark times of my life. I like, can safely say that. And it's the whole thing of being away from home, you know, your work and your job and being, uh, not being able to do that and not being able to, to show up to work and then you lose one of your senses and you're just essentially putting full faith in doctors and you have no idea what to, what to expect. And it was, it seemed somewhat innocuous whenever it happened and didn't think anything of it. And then whenever I went and saw the doctor, essentially not only that, but had the, the two detached retinas that came out of it and yeah, it was blind for a decent chunk. And the, one of the worst things, and I'll probably not talk about it too much. One of the worst things about it is you come out of there, right. And I remember going to a game and playing like, Geelong and a semi or prelim, I think. And I, I couldn't see anyone on the field. I was just sitting there and just thinking to myself, like, probably never going to play this game again. Like, probably never going to be able to go back out there and and be able to perform on the big stage. And, yeah, it's, it's quite depressing times. You're thinking, like, what do I do next in life? Like, what's what's the next thing? What can I do? Can I even write an email? I can't see at the moment. So, like, am I ever going to be able to work a normal job again? Am I ever going to be able to, you know, do the simple things in life that I took for granted for a long time? And I didn't know the answers to it at that point. And, you get to the next, you know, things progressively get better, but obviously you're waiting on time because you can't just flick your fingers and go, okay, everything's back like to normal. It was a, it was a long process. I'm still going through it now, but I got to the next year and I would have been in the best shape of my life going into that next year. And we, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't see, which doesn't help. Um, <laughs> but was in the best shape of my life uh, going into like 2020 was really looking to have a great year, but just like physically couldn't see anything. Like I, I think I've talked about it. I was like, I was going into marking contests. The ball was coming in. I would just engage with the defender because I had no idea where the ball was going to land. And I was just essentially hoping that he knew where the ball was going to go. And I could just last second kind of put the arms out and take a mark and wasn't launching the ball whatsoever. And was essentially half blind out there trying to play football, which is 
impossible. So tack on the fact that we're going through a pandemic. I can't even see doctors to get properly like looked at. I'm essentially just going off phone calls at this point, trying a bunch of different options as far as contacts, nothing working. It was just frustrating, like so frustrating because you just, you felt physically like I'm in the best shape of my life, but then you have something that is so necessary and it's such a necessity to football you can't fix and you can't do anything to make it better and you're just sitting there and that's that's what's holding you back and that was like the shittiest thing. Like it was not only the COVID stuff, obviously everything else of the chaos and stress of that, but the fact that you couldn't properly do your job and you had these high expectations of yourself, wanted to be successful and felt like you're in the best shape of your life and your body was just not allowing you to actually complete, just sucked. It was shit. And you go through that year and I'm one, sorry, I, I essentially had to play X amount of games to be able to get into another contracted year and there's stories behind that. I'll, I'm sure I'll tell at some point in my life, but Eventually end up getting the extension, which was massive for me because I wasn't really sure what the, the future was going to hold. And everyone's in this depressive state of being, you know, absolute shit house. And I think we were like, I can't remember what we were in the, uh, in the hub, how we went. You beat West Coast, which no, was, that's what it was. Yeah. one of the all time finals and then yeah. came out and couldn't back it up, unfortunately. Yeah. West Coast goes out. And that was kind of like, I think that was good. all our effort <laughs> went into that. We were fucked after that game. But because that was the one where. They had you sleeping in caravans oh, and yeah. all of that stuff outside. Full, like, just shamble shit show trying to get it together. And West Coast, you know, with Mark McGowan, essentially a different country at the time, not wanting us to win that game, did everything in his power to make sure we couldn't. And it was kind of like this bullshit of politics and sport that kind of ran through. And I, I'm, it was, like, we looking from the other side, it was embarrassing the way that, like, politics handled that. And we were put in the worst situation, essentially handcuffed the whole way through. And then we got to the game and just gave a big fuck you to West Coast. And one by one point, and that was uh, one of those moments, I think, where myself and DC were playing at the time together. And um, It clicked again. It clicked last again. game of the year. Yeah, last game of the year. and uh, Or second to last game of the year. And You kicked three. Kicked three. And there was a guy, never forget, this guy in the stadium, or in the stands, he's this big overweight fella in the cheer squad, and I'm on the line. I think I'd kicked one, and he's sitting there just giving it to me, saying, you fucking Trump supporter, you fucking American, <laughs> you piece of shit. Oh, what like going at me? I'm looking at this, this guy. must be the <laughs> wildest human I've ever met. You know, he's like, oh, you, you scum, you're missing that, you know, and then kick the second, kick the third, gave him the shh, and told him to sit his ass it's back so down. Yeah, and uh, that man just, didn't say a single thing the rest of the game. And it's those it's those moments where like you want to prove people wrong, you know, and that's what that gets me up and about. Like, you can people tell. doubt you. I'm like, all right, time to just put people back in their fucking place. Um, but yeah, that that game was amazing. I think in my career, looking back, and some of those games that you're up against the wall, and no one expects you to win, and you somehow come out on top. And um, the situation, of course, tacked onto it is is something you're kind of, I guess, proud of how you're ha- able to handle it um, as a club. Also tacked onto the getting the win over there. And we will touch on them, the goggles. So mm. a lot has been said about them over the journey. Signed a, signed a, uh, a poster. It's like, can I have your goggles, Coxie, after the game last week? <laughs> you probably need them. <laughs> yeah, they're way too <laughs> custom for anyone else to have. Uh, but what was the, the whole experience like playing with them for the first time, even getting them past you know, the oh. AFL to getting them out onto the field? The whole thing was, so I, the AFL I'd never really seen anything. I think someone else will play with glasses once before, but... Um, yeah, i had done a lot on my own. I did all the research to find them on my own. Um, so I had multiple trials with contacts and then um, Googled sports glasses. And I saw some NBA players wearing them, stuff like that. I just Googled it. And there's one person out in Colac, isports.com. You shout out to them, um, who have helped me through the journey and just kind of drove out to Colac. It's funny. I ever drove out to Colac and they had different tints of different colors. And we sat there and put them into the, uh, into the frames had a kick with his kid out on the ground out there and just kind of decided which tints I wanted, you know, and we went through this whole process of, you know, darker and medium and people will notice on my glasses, there's one that's darker than mm. another because of the injury. And um, it just really kind of honed in and just nutted down this thing of like trying to figure out the details of what would work the best. And um, it was, it was interesting. I went and did that. No one really knew about it. And I just showed up one day at training and I was like, well, this is, it was a real kind of like moment of nervousness. Like I remember like, thinking like, what are people going to say? Like, what's going to happen, you know? And I think players were aware of how bad my injuries were, but until I started wearing the glasses, I think the story kind of came out of how properly, like how properly 
like bad the actual injury was. And um, yeah, the first time we're in it, a lot of uh, Hakeem Olajuwon comments and stuff <laughs> like that, you know, and Kareem comments and things like that. But that was a real nervous moment in my like, career as I kind of bring those out and being different. Like I've always been different, but I think it's always been different for positive reasons. And then that was the first reason of, I guess, like someone making fun of me in a, in a different sense. But um, yeah, after the first like training session, essentially it was just normality after that. So people stopped wearing them. And now... Bobby Hill tries them on before every game, I feel like. And he's like, oh, the speed dealers, brother. Like, this is sick, you know? And um, just stuff like that. And like, like, one of the cool things that's come from it, I never expected it, but like, you know, it's nowadays, I'll, I'll, probably on the weekly, I would get a message or a comment from someone saying, you know, my kid never felt comfortable wearing, you know, protective gear whenever he was playing. And now, because he has someone to look up to and idolize in a sense um, that's doing it at the highest level, like now he feels comfortable to, to play Oz Kick. And um, I don't know, one of these days, maybe you know one of those kids turns into being an afl footballer who knows and it's that story kind of links back into me which would be pretty cool but yeah i've had a lot of amazing um just kind of connections that have come from it and amazing kind of comments around it and yeah it was tough i mean the afl essentially almost didn't allow me to do it and they told me i couldn't wear them for a preseason even though i'd worn them all preseason all training during the preseason they're very well aware of it they sent me essentially a uh, a letter saying that I'd have to sign it. So I had to be able to play the next day versus Hawthorne out in like, I think Moe it was. And they sent me a letter that said I had to sign it saying that they don't want any legal liabilities if something happens because of them. Mm. And I had to go and find a lawyer within 24 hours to get him ticked off. And then they said, you need to sharpie out any advertising that might be on the side of them. So this is like F5, I think, or something like that on the side of it, which is just the model of mm. the glasses. It doesn't even say like rec specs or anything yeah. like that. And they're like, you have to sharpie out every single little thing. And they just made it really a pain in the ass to wear. And I was just like, this is a medical thing. Which was and so like, bizarre because one, it's a tool of the trade. You need yeah. it to be able to play. Like any boots you're allowed to wear, any brand of any boots, even if they clash with your team sponsors mm. or anything. And then they came out and celebrated it the whole weekend, yeah. taking photos of your videos, putting it on social, it's Mason with his goggles, all that stuff. It was bizarre. It's AFL is a bizarre place. I'll say that. On top of that, we were talking about so your eye injuries. It's we're yeah. still going back to your the key forward at times. Yeah. In one of the biggest clubs in the land. All the pressure, like all the good stuff that comes with that when you're winning the prelim for them. Yeah. And then you get all the bad stuff when you're underperforming. It's all tenfold. So the pressure comes on, bucks out, fly in, real crazy period of time for the, the club. I think at that time in my career. I was ready to call it quits. I was like, this is bullshit. Like, I'm just so stressed out. I'm not enjoying life. Like, this is not what I was made, you know, to do for the rest of my life. Like, I was ready to call it quits and was just done with it and was probably going to go to a different team if there's an opportunity, but got to that off season without a contract, not really knowing where I was going to go, what was going to happen and kind of had come to, I guess, grips with the fact that like career is done and like it is what it is. It was fun. We move on. We try to find out what the next chapter is. And um, I remember before I left, uh, being on the sprung floor, doing some kicking and stuff. And Craig came in. And it was kind of like the day that he was kind of announced as head coach. And in my mind, I'd already I'd already committed essentially in my mind like and confirmed that I was, I was dying. Like I wasn't going to play there again. Like I had really bad taste in my mouth from everything that had kind of happened the years before and wasn't really happy with where things were. And there's a lot of change. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just time for me to move on. And um, I just remember like Craig walking in. I go, fuck you, dude. You're the only person, <laughs> you're the only person in this whole world that would get me back to this club probably. Mm. And he walked in and he, he did his speech of what he wants to do as a coach and everything else. And I just remember sitting there going, this fucking asshole. <laughs> it's like, I actually want to play, I want to play for you, man. And like what you've been able to give to me to be able to set up my career was like something I've always wanted to repay him. And I thought, fuck man, like if there's ever an opportunity, it's, it's now. So in my mind, I was kind of like, I hope, hopefully they kind of give me a gig. And Craig was like, look, it's not my decision. It's the club's decision where they want to keep you. And he was not part of me signing another contract or what they gave me and offered me. And um, fortunate enough, they did offer me something. And yeah, it's, it's kind of cool now. I think it's one of the biggest reasons I still am playing and still want to play is like I always talk about what I want to do and wanting to repay Fly for what he gave to me. So like, I think over the last few weeks, you've seen some of the stuff that's on the inside of people's jumpers um, on the neckline. So you've got like, I think, Braden had like competitive beast, yeah. right? And like Jack had 
entertainer or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah. Like mine says repay fly. And like that's kind of something I've always been in my mind, everything every time I go pa- like play, that's I always think about him, what he's given up and the, the opportunities he's given me and thought how cool would it be now to like full circle this thing, full like the universe kind of coming back on itself and being able to give him, you know, success and be part of that and help him kind of reach what he wants to wants to accomplish as a coach. So that's kind of one of the reasons I still do it and one of the main reasons I'm still playing. But yeah, that, that year I was I was ready to call it quits and then Fly came in and that was kind of the the only person probably in this world that could keep me at the club and had some serious conversations throughout that first year of getting dropped after playing a few terrible games at the beginning and then coming back and then like the game I came back, we won 11 straight and talk about sliding doors moments. So like, you know, I, at that point we started this podcast whenever I started playing VFL, I think it was, and I was like, you know, this is probably it. Like, I'm not playing well. It's not. It's not working. Like, just gonna have to try to move into the next phase of life, which hopefully would be media. So let's start this podcast and see what we can do with it. And it's been awesome to be to be enjoying it. And now, obviously, still playing. It's it's cool to still kind of everything essentially is extra now. But I remember coming back and sliding doors moments of Brody gets injured, does his patella tendon, I think it was, or something like that, and I get an opportunity to come back. Or Beggy actually coming back. Aiden Beg comes back and plays before me, and I was pretty filthy, but look back at the Trav Cloak thing. I was like, well, mm. maybe this is my moment of Trav Cloak, you know, like maybe this is me passing the torch on to someone else. And he played a really good game. And then, yeah, a couple of down, downer games compared to that first one. And then got the opportunity to come back up and play with DC and we won 11 straight. And, you know, that kind of changed probably the opportunity because we talk about, you know, if we lose some of those games, you know, maybe we go into rebuilding mode and we go some of the older guys, we'll start playing the younger guys and the older guys get pushed out and we start revamping and, Everyone, no one would have asked a question of that. Everyone would have gone, well, Colin was a young team, new coach, you know, he wants to revamp everything. Like, that's just part of the process. And I would have been one of those players that would just got moved on. And uh, luckily enough, the young guy stepped up and kept us old boys around a little bit longer yeah. and we won 11 straight. So it's, um, you talk about those sliding doors moments, there's a lot of those in the career. And that was definitely one that, looking back, I was like, if Brody doesn't get injured, and obviously that good friend of mine never would want that upon anyone, but if he doesn't get injured, he doesn't get moved on his contract doesn't get taken up by another person and I am no longer playing for Collingwood. Yeah, it is a twist of fate that it just mm-hmm. happens to be fly that comes in. Now, you did the 60 Minutes feature, big feature over in the States, and there was some great stuff in there about Wolf well, Fly being there from the start of your career, getting videos back from you <laughs> overseas saying that you, you can't really kick for shit. Yeah. There was this the statement that, you saw Fly sitting on the Richmond bench in the 2018 mm. prelim and you said, You did this. You did this. <laughs> this is your fault. <laughs> Which is great. And it, it is it is just the fact that it was him that came in and like you said, it literally, I feel like it could have only been one guy. Mm. And he had a great impact on everyone to date. You guys go on the fairy tale run. A lot of people see Fly externally and say, geez, he must be great to play for. Yeah. A lot of guys want to come into the club mm. rejuvenated. You got all these young guys playing really great footy with a really healthy mix of like older, mature heads in there. Yeah. And the club's in a great position. So like, and it's been really good to have the podcast here to kind of ride it every week last, every week last year was like, God, it just did it by it's six really points, one point, oh, 10 yeah. points. It's like, can you, can you get a big win? But it was just so fun and everyone talks about how fun it is and the amount of messages that we get through the podcast where it's like oh, I'm a Richmond supporter we're having a down year I never thought I'd say it but I love watching Collingwood games or like Essendon supporters or you know all these big rivals that would always hate Collingwood mm. we're getting so many messages just alone saying how much they're enjoying watching Collingwood play you play in particular like it's a crazy thing that you guys are doing and it must be fun again you talked about the last few years that you went through injuries ups and downs it must be fun to play this footy again and it's been reflected outside of spleen injury (laughs) um you've played a really good solid year of footy yeah it's 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 good i think i've talked about people this as of recent because a lot of people have been talking about how good the culture is and credit to craig and the coaching staff and everyone else that's created it um it's it's totally changed the place and whenever you go through the tough times, the dark times, the the challenging times, and then you have experiences like now where it's, you know, exciting, everyone's enjoying it, like, and you're in a happy place, like, 
you kind of you want to soak it in and like really enjoy it as much as you can and it's um it's one of those things like whenever you the older you get the more you have these experiences of the highs and the lows and everything else and whenever you have an opportunity as to be able to recognize a high you really enjoy it that much more and i think that's what a lot of us are doing at the moment and especially the older guys um i'll talk about like after games like i never we'd always just go down you know you, you win the game you lose the game you get on the race sing the song or you don't whoever it is you move on and now it's like you kind of like after every single game I'll finish up and I'll just kind of like 360 the MCG and I'm just kind of think like how crazy is this man like how crazy is life and it's like soak it in as much as you can because you know that this is a fleeting time career could be done in a game as I, with my eye injuries and stuff I realize like every game could be my last and you just want to make sure that if it is your last game you got to enjoy it for the fullest amount and like looking around seeing people chant USA as you're going through the cheer squad and then down into the rooms and stuff and everyone have the smile on their faces. Like you just, you really kind of enjoy those moments now, I think more than I ever probably have before. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good time and everyone's really enjoying, I think, um, what's happening at the Collingwood Football Club at the moment. And whatever happens from this point to your last game, mm. you've left a mark now. There's, there's no, it's undeniable. You've left a mark. You've had massive games along the journey. You're always going to be that, the first American. You talk about not being the first, um, like, mm, native born, born American yeah, yeah. to uh, play, but you're definitely going to be the first that hits 100 games. And mm. you, you might hold that record for, <laughs> for, a, a, while, for a hell of a long time. So there's plenty that you've done throughout your career. And from the impacts that you had on people all across Australia, it's just, yeah, it's a massive achievement and a massive accomplishment for what you've done. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a real credit to you. A hundred games, there's going to be more. That's the next question. What's next for Mason Cox? Um, hopefully a premiership. It rounded off pretty well, I think. You talk about windows and opportunities, and I think we're definitely in that window at the moment, as a lot of people would probably agree. And yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. Because like, yeah, at a certain point, probably the beginning of last year, you didn't, you thought, you know, you come to a realization in grips so you probably won't ever win a grand final and that twenty eighteen probably sticks out in your head a lot a lot stronger than other days. And now you're kinda of looking at it and you're going, Well, maybe you know, maybe we're in that kind of you know, those few years, wherever it is, that we can actually, you know, win this whole thing. So yeah, it's it's that's it's hopefully what's next. I don't know if it'll be, you know, this year, or next year and never not happen, whatever it is, but I think having that would be something to add to the journey to say it's it's done. You've experienced everything. You can't look back and fault anything you've you've been through it all the ringer the ups the downs and you've made the most of it and you've got to experience everything you could possibly do over here in australia so that'd be a great way to round it off whether or not it happens we'll see um but it's something that is probably what's next and then post-career hopefully media hopefully this podcast launches and we can do some cool stuff around it um shout out to people like dylan buckley or uh i guess like paving the path for ex-athletes of doing these kind of things and um yeah, you know, hopefully this leads to media opportunities post career and, and stay around football and then maybe bring exposure of AFL to the international market. Who knows? Uh, but there's there's definitely hopefully opportunities there and hopefully I get to uh to stay here in Australia long term and do some unique stuff and continue to push the boundaries in the future. And I think we have the name for the episode, Mason Cox, a career of sliding doors. <laughs> uh but yeah, one more time. Congratulations, mate. And oh, Big juicy contest coming up on the weekend against <laughs> North Melbourne. If you if they don't stop you at the gate with their pitchforks, after all the shit that you talk about them, but uh, uh, are you looking forward to it? I am. It's going to be a good day. I think, like I said, not only is it my hundredth, but more importantly, I think it's Steele's three hundredth. And to celebrate him, what he's been able to accomplish is pretty cool. Um, he's done a lot more than I probably have. Very different journeys. Don't get me wrong, but um, it'd be a great day to be able to celebrate him myself. Um, and just be able to to really soak it in. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen on the day. The whole family's coming out. I don't know what to expect. But um, I know there'll be some pretty cool experiences looking back and getting to to reminisce with some people along the journey and uh, bringing them into the rooms and get to experience the whole thing and some of the videos people will probably send through of dumb shit I've done throughout my career <laughs> and funny experiences and things. It's, um, it's one of those cool moments in life. You get to really kind of look back on what you've been able to accomplish. And that's kind of one of the things I'm going to look forward to the most, I think. All right, and I think that wraps us all up. To wrap it up, massive game coming out the hundredth. Um, so thankful for everyone that's you know been a part of it, including yourself, Braden. It's been amazing to share experiences throughout this whole process, and even the early days to talk about back then um, and how things have changed so much. But 
a massive thank you to everyone who's one tuned into this podcast and supported us in the community that's here and and two to everyone that's supported me personally throughout my career and um, everything that's happened it's it's amazing to have amazing supporters um, like everyone out there and you know through ups and downs always having my back and the club's back it's it's pretty incredible to uh to have been able to share this experience with so many different people and I'm extremely grateful and humbled to uh, to have so many supporters out there. So massive thank you. Hopefully you get to enjoy the day just as I will. And um, yeah, go Pies.